God's true prosperity. When Jesus came to earth, he did some amazing things. He had nothing good to say about the religious people, yet he constantly praised his Father in heaven. He performed miracles that no one had ever even seen before, yet he was murdered horribly at the hands of those he loved. Jesus brought a remedy for all sins and sicknesses. He brought the opportunity to know the heart and mind of the Father intimately and to preach to the world on his behalf. Once Jesus finished all he had set out to do, he expected his true friends to follow in his footsteps. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, Jesus said, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Before leaving earth, Jesus told his friends not to do anything until they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. His friends obeyed. They waited. Nine days later, the Holy Spirit arrived, and everyone knew it. The believers were baptized with the Holy Spirit and began to experience a new realm of spiritual power and intimacy with the Lord, just as Jesus had said they would. From then on, believers would have access to all they need to do the miracles that Jesus did. Jesus had high hopes that people producing his same fruits would carry on his work in detail and prove they were his friends. In this one single event, Jesus and the Father had begun a new spiritual kingdom. Jesus told us clearly that in order to enter that kingdom and stay in that kingdom, we must have spiritual riches. Anyone living truly in this new spiritual kingdom craves to be more like Jesus. They crave his holiness, his unselfish love for people, and his power to heal the sick, raise the dead, and preach with power to the world. They want the mind and heart of the Father and therefore long for the riches of God. The true believer recognizes that he is not greater than his master. He willingly anticipates and embraces his own cross of suffering and persecution. He reminds himself that suffering for righteousness' sake brings spiritual riches. Jesus said that if we yearn for spiritual riches, we cannot yearn for earthly riches at the same time. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth share no common ground. Therefore, the riches of the two kingdoms are mutually incompatible and therefore mutually exclusive. If you were to say to the Lord, please give me more riches, would you be asking for more of himself and his spiritual riches? Or would you be asking for more money and earthly riches? The Lord would certainly know and you couldn't be asking for both. For those with no interest in heaven or going there, this message has no purpose. The following warning applies to those who do want to live a life on earth pleasing to the Lord and those who do want to spend eternity in heaven. Beware that a fatal heresy has spread throughout the land. In the third letter of John, verse 2, the writer expressed a simple blessing to the receivers of his letter. He wanted them to have a good earthly journey while traveling toward their heavenly home. John used a word meaning good road and basically stated, God bless you as you live for him. When we pray for a believer to have a good road, we might think of things like protection, provision, good health, and as few obstacles as possible. Just as that believer needs spiritual victory, so he needs the priceless, simple ways the Father provides for earthly needs and victories one day at a time. The verse in its original language was translated by some English versions as, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Although today the English word prosper definitely can refer to money or earthly riches, the original word alluded to no wealth of any kind. The writer John conveyed, I hope that you succeed in what you set out to do. Similarly, the same English word prosper was used in Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. In both instances, the word prosper means to succeed in what you set out to do or to prevail. Again, the original meaning has nothing at all to do with getting rich. For centuries, believers understood this blessing rightly in the context of the rest of scripture. Then, in 1947, a malevolent meaning appeared, sneaking in something totally foreign to the word of God. A man named Oral Roberts proposed a seductive idea that would divert millions of 
would-be Christians to hell. Rather than preaching the true meaning of prosperity based on the gospel of Jesus, Oral Roberts introduced a distorted meaning based on his own money-driven lifestyle. While suppressing all that Jesus taught about money, Roberts promoted a lust for money. In decades following, more preachers like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and Fred Price joined the bandwagon, and the heresy spread far and wide. Today, we refer to it as the prosperity gospel or money gospel. The prosperity gospel teaches that the word prosper specifically does refer to money. It teaches unknowing converts that more than anything else, God wants them to make lots of money. Yet this is the lie that brings certain spiritual death to all who go to their grave believing it. Read on and you'll see why. By 2006, thousands of Christians in their eagerness to have lots of money gladly swallowed the lie, obviously without ever checking to see if Roberts's claims were true. According to a Time magazine poll taken in 2006, the following statistics were obtained. 17% of Christians surveyed said they consider themselves part of this movement, while a full 61% believe that God wants people to be prosperous, and 31%, a far higher percentage than there are Pentecostals in America, agreed that if you give your money to God, God will bless you with more money. If those people were to examine the verse on their own, they would discover a total absence of any reference to money or earthly riches in the original text. With a little more care, they also would see the same word prosper applies to the soul and even to weapons. Obviously, these money preachers were not telling their donors the whole story. However, the magic formula was working very well, especially for those same preachers who got filthy rich from the donations of those who believed them and gave money to them. Tragically, Oral Roberts had created perilous permission slips notarized by a verse of scripture ripped surreptitiously out of context. He sent money-hungry Christians loose with a lust for earthly riches and a commission to collect as many of them as they wanted to. Roberts never told those people that his offer required a hidden trade-off, deceived to think that God wanted them to become rich. The students of Oral Roberts, in their Berean carelessness and thirst for money, abandoned their footpath to heaven to unknowingly board a speedboat to hell. Roberts taught that coveting is okay after all. He taught that chasing money is not only condoned by God, but actually desired by God. Making his lie more damnable, Roberts taught that God wants more than anything else for his children to have lots of money. Using this one verse and his twisted version of it, Oral Roberts scandalously rejected the life of Jesus, contradicted the commands of Jesus, and sent millions of people off the path of Jesus. Right up through today, thousands of people who think they follow Jesus continue to wrongly quote God and say, more than anything, God wants us to be wealthy. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could pose more danger to the souls of believers. Nothing could spell more certain damnation for believers. Nothing could compel more believers to forsake their own cross and to forsake Jesus himself. Scripture contains copious references to riches, some positive and some negative. Without exception, the only positive references to riches are spiritual riches and never earthly riches. Nowhere in the entire Word of God does the Lord ever advise anyone to seek after earthly riches. On the contrary, the New Testament always warns believers to stay away from them. Over and over, Jesus spoke regarding earthly riches like a hot potato and imperatively warned his friends, do not gather them, do not hold on to them, get rid of them. Jesus announced a new standard for living when he told his own disciples to take no purse for their journey. The only riches that Jesus told his followers to get were those things that would draw them closer to him and make them more like him spiritual riches. Jesus warned that the way to spiritual riches and eternal life is a narrow way. To be extra clear on the matter, Jesus stated that it is literally impossible, except by miraculous intervention from God, for someone who is rich in earthly goods to enter the kingdom of heaven. The only riches the Lord approves of are the full riches of complete understanding, 
the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. To acquire the actual attributes of an all-powerful, loving God, one does get spiritually rich. A true believer must fight the fight of faith to win an eternal award in heaven. And the only way we can do that is by getting spiritual riches. In contrast to spiritual riches, the Lord warns heavily against earthly riches, including the pursuit of money, the accumulation of money, and even the very desire for money, which Jesus calls coveting. According to scripture, even the slightest, I wish I were rich, could take us dangerously across the loving line the Lord has given us regarding physical needs, possessions, and our desire for them. If we fail to heed the scriptural warnings about this kind of prosperity, then according to scripture, we will likely lose our faith fall short of the Lord's glory and his will for our life, that being sin, and actually miss heaven, ending up in hell instead, literally. In a nutshell, this is what Jesus said about earthly riches. Never seek them, never trust in them, never hold on to them, never hold back from sharing them whenever one of the brothers is in need, and beware that they will keep you from entering the kingdom of heaven outside of a direct intervention from God. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. He said again, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes nor moth destroys. Only one of the churches addressed in Revelation received no corrections or complaints from the Lord. Was it mere coincidence that that church was materially poor? I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. James wrote, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Matthew, Luke, and Mark all recorded Jesus saying that it is easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Although the Aramaic word for rope has been translated camel, either way, Hey, the analogy shows something way too big trying to pass through an entrance that cannot and will not accommodate its volume. In either instance, the Lord would say, did I not tell you that it is impossible? The word used for rich in most of these verses is plusios. It means wealthy, abounding in material resources. It does not imply royalty, having a political position, living in a large castle, or any particular type of abundance. It refers to someone with an abundance of money or things, and refers easily to literally millions of Christians today. Paul warned Timothy, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Paul warned, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things. The words love and covet simply suggest one's desire to get things and to keep things for themselves. That's all. When was the last time we just had to have something we really didn't need? Or we refused to share our extra with a brother in in need who had none. Jesus warned that we cannot serve God, doing all that he requires of us, while also serving money, doing all that it requires of us. We pursue one or the other, but never both at the same time. If the rich young ruler were to see the houses and luxury conveniences most of us have today, no doubt he would laugh hearing us say that he was even a penny richer than we are. If the rich young ruler heard us declare that our possessions don't hinder our salvation, he would no doubt protect How come they don't have to sell all their stuff? And he'd be right. We read in the Old Testament that Solomon, the son of David, pleased the Lord by asking for wisdom rather than earthly riches. Because of Solomon's choice, the Lord blessed him with both types of riches. By the end of his life, however, Solomon strayed seriously from his first love, and his earthly riches had played a big part in his fall. In the New Covenant, we see no instances where the Lord blessed any of his followers with an abundance of earthly goods. Not one. The Lord promised to provide for all of their needs, and he did meet their needs. Yet nowhere did he supply even one of them with wealth. Wherever wealth did exist, Jesus always, always 
told them urgently to get rid of it and share it with the needs of other believers. Sometimes the Lord provided miraculously for needs. When faced with a large crowd to feed, he miraculously multiplied food to feed them. He did not, however, miraculously increase the storehouse of just one eater that day. When faced with a temple tax, Jesus provided one silver coin from the mouth of a fish. At no time, however, did he do that in order to increase the financial storehouse for himself or anyone else. If any believers did have more than they needed, they shared their abundance with the needs occurring in the local group of believers. This was standard policy for them. But where do we find that policy stated in Scripture? It's simple. Jesus commanded that we must love our neighbor by doing for him exactly what we would do for ourselves if we were in his shoes. Or as though we were that person. Loving a needy neighbor means considering his need as though it were our own, thus doing anything in our own power to meet that need. Though hard-hitting, the concept is not exactly rocket science. Loving your neighbor as though he were you obviously would not and did not allow the early believers with extra possessions to hold back from helping their brother or sister in need. Yet today, this godly kind of love remains unconscionably absent. Rather than giving based on individuals' needs, church members today tithe to man-led incorporated groups they call churches. Rather than giving based on the extras in one's pocket and the needs around them, tithers focus on a standard 10% exhorted that that is all God really requires. And that used to be the case. Yet according to Jesus, the high priest of the new covenant, the policy of just tithing or even tithes plus offerings is a blatant lie. Jesus commanded that we give based on the extra possessions we have versus the needs of people around us. This command absolutely supersedes and displaces the token 10% and calls us to a much deeper level of love and financial commitment to our brothers and sister believers. I have not heard of one church today that looks out for believers' personal needs and meeting them on a regular basis, as the early believers did. Today's churches focus rather on full-time salaries, church building upkeep, and maybe a few organized religious projects. They refuse to acknowledge those who fellowship with them week after week who struggle financially. How far we have strayed from all believers answering the clarion call, all believers edifying one another, and authentic fellowship in believers' homes rather than in the theater-style setups we call churches. How grossly today's theater churches themselves forsake the very meeting they accuse their non-attendees about forsaking. In Hebrews 10.25, we read, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Sharing and ministering to one another is a far cry from our modern mini-theater churches set up for main speaker and audience. Being part of an audience was not what the writer of Hebrews had in mind by exhorting one another, not by a long shot. Just imagine how many believers with plenty of extra encounter other believers with plenty of need, but part from them with only a stingy, I'll pray for you, or a hypocritical, I feel so badly for you. In 1 John 3.17, the same writer John chastised such stinginess and absence of love when he said, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? His question was rhetorical, and John had a point to make. That person has no love. Meeting after meeting, the Lord watches the hardened hearts of so-called Christians mouthing words of worship and devotion to him while ignoring dire needs of precious believers sitting right next to them as they do. Since the early believers obeyed Jesus' second command, believers never went away in need. Since today's so-called Christians rarely obey Jesus' second command, needy believers almost always go away in need. The early Christians owned things in common, sharing freely with each other. The early believers went way beyond the 10% gift, the financial portfolios, and the miniature castles so many Christians today call home. How far we have strayed from the Lord. Obviously, before wicked excuses took hold, believers lived a far more loving, godly existence than we do today. Showing true love for God and true love for each other, their lives reflected something most Christians today don't even believe in, leave alone, engage in. A married couple at the time, Ananias and Sapphira, 
had property that was extra for them, so obviously they sold it to meet the needs of other believers. Afterwards, they decided to hold back some of the money and lied to the group leaders about the money they had made. What happened to them for doing this? The Lord struck them dead. Even though their lie surely played a part, you can be sure that the Lord was also very angry that they had covetously held back what was needed by their brothers. Do we really think the Lord has changed his policy? The fact is, most Christians today haven't even taken the first step of selling their extra property. If the old covenant tithe were still in effect at the time, Ananias and Sapphira would never have been compelled to sell their property, leave alone to hand over the entire amount they made to their credit. They did take the first step and in fact still did far more than most Christians today would ever do. Why should today's so-called Christians be allowed to keep the untouchable 90% for themselves? How can they possibly believe they obey the second command while driving home from church in their fancy cars to eat fancy food and live in royally equipped mini castles right after worshiping with those in dire need of the basics? Where is their conviction as they pull this off week after week? The Lord is watching. Are we naive to think that the rich young ruler was the only one with a money problem? Jesus would say, Woe unto you that are rich, for you have, have received your consolation. James would say, Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Jesus gave very simple instructions to his followers concerning money and earthly things. If you do the things I have asked you to do, then I will take care of all your needs. I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can you, any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Rather than seeking after these things, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This message is not just for comfort to the believer, though it surely comforts. It is even more. It is a literal command. It lays out very definite orders regarding physical needs on earth. It instructs the child of God what he must do and what he must not do concerning earthly needs. Jesus said, I will take care of your needs, not you. You must focus on the things that are of spiritual importance, and I will provide for all your physical needs while you do that. When a man or woman joins the military, he never chooses where his assignment will be. He does not line up his supplies, store up his food, or shop for his uniform. Neither does that soldier think about anything but basic needs when he goes out to serve. Luxury and fun had nothing to do with his enlisting. Jesus said the just will walk by faith. We must trust him as we go along and focus only on the job he has given us and not focus on how to provide for ourselves while doing it. Has the church become that patterned after the world and its thinking? Or was Jesus getting a bit too carried away on this issue? If we choose to treat those words as mere parables, then we better be sure that we have scriptural reasons for completely ignoring what Jesus commanded. The Holy Spirit in Revelation declares he has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All true believers are actually priests, and priests personally own nothing. So, was Oral Roberts telling the truth? Does Jesus really want more than anything else for us to lust after the things of this world and in his name make getting rich one of our main goals? Well, what parent would repeatedly warn his son or daughter to avoid a certain place because of its grave dangers and then out of the blue announce, my greatest wish is for you to go there? What loving Jesus would warn his children heavily against pursuing those things that specifically lead to hell and then out of nowhere say, more than anything else, I want you to get those things. Jesus already stated what he wants more than anything else for us and it was completely opposite of what Oral Roberts taught. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and 
love those around you as though they were you. If we do those two things, we fulfill the entire law. And therefore, those two things please the Lord more than anything else. It's time to choose. Do we crave the Lord's perfect will for our life and all the spiritual riches we need to fulfill his will? Or do we crave the things of this world because I studied hard for them? I earned them. I am special. I deserve them, and my children deserve to inherit them. The words of Jesus were clear. We cannot crave earthly riches and crave the Lord at the same time. You cannot hold on to earthly riches and hold on to the Lord at the same time. Don't be led by the lie. Turn away from your riches, lest one day, with heaven's gates finally in view, you find yourself eternally stuck in the eye of that needle.